have a wonderful set of speakers uh, for you all to uh, hear from today. Uh, and so let me do a introduction of them both and then I'll hand it over to them. Um, I should also mention that the uh, general outline of how we uh, you do these um, webinars is that we'll have the speakers give the presentations and they are more than happy and wanting to uh, answer your questions. And so I encourage you all uh, during that time that, that they're speaking uh, to put in in the chat or in the Q&A box your questions. And then after their presentations, we will address those. So without further ado, let me introduce the first speaker, Dr. Susan Taylor. Uh, she is a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, as well as pharmacology at the University of California, San Diego. She is known for her research on structure and function of protein kinases. And in 1991, her group, together with some collaborators, solved the crystal structure for PKA. For her pivotal work in the protein kinases, Dr. Taylor has been elected to the Institute of Medicine, as well as the National Academy of Science. And more recently, earlier this year, she was awarded the Herbert Ta Tabor Research Award. And today she's gonna give us an introduction into PKA, C-beta, sorry. Following uh, Dr. Taylor, we'll hear from Dr. Janae Roa. Dr. Janae Roa earned a PhD in bi marine biology from Scripps Inst uh, Institute of Oceanography at UC San Diego where she specialized in acid-based physiology of marine elasmobracts. That's like sharks and stingrays and such. And then she continued her training uh, with an NSF postdoctoral post fellowship with Professor Martin Tresguiris and Colin Bounder, I hope I pronounced that correctly, as well as then more recently with an NIH postdoctoral fellowship with uh, Professor Susan Taylor, as well as Deruda Shurnoska, Kratik at UC San Diego. And today she's going to give us a talk on her recent work on retina, a window into PKA signaling in neuron sciences. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Anna. And um, it's really a, an honor to, to talk here because this has been, this program has really nucleated um, a major new uh, direction in, in my laboratory. And um, so I'm really very, very grateful to this program. And obviously I've been a, a passionate advocate for interdisciplinary science all of my career. And this is really making me appreciate firsthand why that is so imp extremely important. So um, uh, we're gonna talk about the retina mostly today, but, but maybe wondering why is PKA here at this IDG conference? PKA, why? Um, it was the second kinase that was discovered in 1958. So it's one of the oldest kinases. Um, so it's been there for a long time. It was the first one to be sequenced in 1981. And SARC was actually sequenced a couple of years before PKA and thought to be a kinase, but no one knew what a kinase looked like. And so it wasn't until PKA was sequenced that Margaret Dayhoff, one of the real pioneer informatics investigators recognized, yes, there was a homology and they did evolve from the same gene. And so unlike the phosphatases, which have little branches, um, the kinome is one, one big tree with many branches. So, and it was the first one, PKA was the first one to be sequenced. Mm -hmm. And then this like 30 years ago, it's a special year, 30 years ago, we saw the structure that was the first protein kinase to be crystallized. So why on earth, why is PKA, it's, it's been used as a model, a prototype for catalysis. We've kind of crystallized it, all the catalytic state. Um, it's been used for um, defining spines, all kinds of things. Why on earth is PKA part of the dark kinome? It's obviously very at the top of the bright illuminated kinome. Why is it at the bottom? And so this is something that we and others have just, it's, we just haven't appreciated the importance of um, this isoform. So, you can see, as I told you, PKA 
the C alpha gene, everything we know about the protein, almost every single thing we know about the protein is about the C alpha protein. And um, if you look more closely there, you see this C beta gene. And um, you can see there's a lot of isoforms of PKC up above PKA. And we know a lot about those different PKC isoforms from Newton, Alexander Newton's lab and many others. But PKC beta has sort of remained obscure. And um, just to tell you the difference, if you look at C alpha one, which we know so much about and C beta one, they're almost exactly the, the same. They're the same size. They differ only by 25 amino acids. Those amino acids actually do turn out to be really different and are probably important functionally. They, they are involved with the tails that wrap around the kinase core. But C beta is also different from C alpha in that you have these, these variants, C beta two, <clears throat> which is much longer at the end terminus. These all differ only by the first exon, which in, in PKA alpha one and beta one are only 14 residues. You have C beta three, which is much shorter, C beta four, which is hardly anything, C beta four AB, that should be AB. Then you have four uh, ABC, you have different splice variants of C beta three. So there's a, a cluster of C beta proteins that are, all distinct proteins. And um, I will try and make you appreciate why that is so significant. Um, again, there are only 25 amino acids different. And you can see from the, um, from the little cartoon here that there's some, a lot in the envelope, but there are many cluster around them. And just to, just to show you um, how they cluster around. This is just a movie highlighting this. You can see the C-terminal tail and the N-terminal tail. They wrap around the kinase core. The kinase core is conserved in all kinases, everyone on that, on that tree. You can map it to PKA and get a reasonable homo homolog structure from, from the core. But the tails or the domains that wrap around each kinase are different. And, and they are really, really important for function. Sometimes just one or two amino acids can make an ex a critical difference. And so let's look at this also for tissue expression. And this is again, based on RNA hybridization. And you can just see um, globally here, if you look at different tissues, C beta one is expressed at low levels in, in most tissues. So C beta one is in most tissues. C alpha one is ubiquitous in every tissue. But if you now go look at these um, variants of C beta, the other splice variants, you see some very interesting things. You see C beta two is highly expressed in lymphoid tissues, especially in, in T cells, macrophages, um, but it's not expressed in, in most other cells. So it's very highly expressed in a few tissues. And then if you look at C beta four, and the same is true for C beta three, you see it's almost exclusively expressed in the brain. And so I would, I would argue that the brain is probably the most highly differentiated um, organ in, <clears throat> in our body. It's very, very complex, but you can see this tissue specific expression is really important. And you know, for me, it points out a lesson Roger Chen always told me, you know, that you can't just do a structure. You need to understand what these molecules are doing in the cells where they live. And, and again, one can't just do structures. You have to do the whole spectrum. You need to understand where that protein is in cells, in specific cells, and where they are in the tissue because cells communicate with each other. It's a very critical lesson. And here's just, again, hybridization of embryos. You can see the constitutively expressed PKA subunits. I see alpha, R1 alpha, R2 alpha. And there's lots of diseases associated with R1 alpha. Um, and then you can see the beta ones are more selective in how they're expressed. They're all enriched in brain and neuronal tissues. Um, and we've, we've done a lot. We've compared R1 beta and R2 beta in the brain and show how differently they localize. But look at C beta. It's the one that people haven't really looked at over all these years. And you can see how enriched it is in, in neuronal tissues. And so um, you can appreciate this specificity of the C beta isoforms even more by looking at, again, this is based on early um, 1989, early hybridization studies when the C beta isoforms were first cloned. 
And you can see again, C beta one, which is expressed in all tissues at low levels. You can see it's expressed in a very specific manner. See how it's enriched here at the hippocampus, very specific. And even in this early hybridization, you can see C beta four, which was highly expressed in the brain. You can see Again, yes, it's very enriched in the brain, but its expression is different. Look how different it is from C beta one, C beta four, and C beta three is not as highly expressed, but it is differentially expressed and it's in a very specific way. Here you can see it by the hippocampus. So, you know, are these functionally non-redundant? What are the biochemical differences? Um, is C beta relevant for disease? Um, and are they targeted differently? And it's the targeting that we're really gonna focus on today and, and tell you about. And um, just again, on the RNA hybridization, you can see C, C alpha one, R1 alpha, they're expressed in all tissues, very high levels of them in all tissues. But if you look, again, this is not distinguishing between the isoforms, just pan C beta. C beta is expressed at low levels in most cells, and that's probably C beta one. But you can see how highly it enriched it is in the brain, in the different parts of the brain. And um, so we think this is really such a rich opportunity for delving deeply into PKA signaling. Half of PKA signaling is in the brain is being carried out by C beta isoforms that we know virtually nothing about. And so um, I wanted to introduce you to this team. And this is, um, as Anna pointed out, this has uh, been a collaboration with uh, Dorota, who's a, 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 at the University of California, Irvine, right up the road from us, who's a specialist in, in the retina and in um, especially RNA transcription. Um, and this has been a, a really a very interdisciplinary team. Um, Frank Ma is a... a research specialist in my laboratory, and Janae is a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory. Um, so Big New is uh, at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology, has helped us with some of the beautiful images that you'll see. And um, uh, Quilan is a staff scientist in Dorota's lab. So it's very interdisciplinary, and I am learning so much myself from this collaboration. It's, it's just opened up a whole new world for me. And I we're really anxious to get feedback from, especially from uh, clinical people, from disease samples. We've been working exclusively so far, almost exclusively with human retina. So we can really image PKA in any disease phenotype that, that you may have. So those collaborations are gonna be really important. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Shanae. Hi. Okay. Thank you, Susan. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, yeah. Today we're going. I'm going to be presenting some of the data that we've gotten looking at uh, PKA in the human retina, and we're going to be using the retina as a hopefully as a window into PKA signaling in neurons. And Susan did a great uh, introduction to PKA. I just wanted to add to that introduction. So PKA. There are cell and tissue specific uh, regulations via expression of the different PKA uh, isoforms. So if you're not familiar with PKA, there, it is comprised of a regulatory subunit dimer uh, and two separate catalytic subunits. And for each of these, there are uh, four isoforms for the regulatory subunits. So R1 alpha, R1 beta, R2 alpha, and R2 beta. And for the catalytic subunits, there are three isoforms, C alpha, C beta, and C gamma. And PKA is going to be activated by uh, cyclic AMP. And there are two sources for cyclic AMP in the cell. So there are the transmembrane adenocyclases. So these are going to be found at the cell membrane. Um, they're going to be activated by hormones through GPCR activation. Um, and they're going to produce cyclic AMP that goes on to bind to the regulatory subunit dimer of PKA to release the catalytic subunits in order for them to do their, um, their action. The second source for cyclic AMP within the cell is going to be soluble adenocyclase. So that's SAC. So SAC is going to be found um, diffuse throughout the cytoplasm of the cell. So here we have SAC here. Um, so SAC is directly activated by the carbonate, and that comes from several sources, 
um, either extracellular or intracellular through mitochondria and the action of carbonic anhydrases. Uh, and activation of PKA leads to different um, factors. It can regulate metabolism, gene expression, cell growth and division, uh, as well as cell differentiation. And as uh, Susan mentioned, uh, a lot of our recent research is looking at the catalytic subunits. So looking at C-alpha versus C-beta um, localization specifically because C-alpha is the most often studied catalytic subunit. And what we've been asking recently is what about C-beta? Um, and as Susan just mentioned, uh, C-alpha is ubiquitously expressed in all tissues. So you're gonna see it found throughout all tissues, whereas uh, C-beta is uh, potentially expressed in uh, all tissues, but it is more highly expressed in tissues found in the brain. So we're looking at this localization or high expression in the brain and trying to differentiate between these two different subunits. So the study system that we have been working with recently is the human retina. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the human retina, so you have light coming in through the pupil and it's hitting the retina, which is on the back of the eye. And there are very uh, distinguished cell types throughout the retina. And if we delve a little bit deeper into the different cell types, we see that there are generally three different cell types. So the first cell types are gonna be the photoreceptors. And within that class, there are two cells. There are our rod and our cone cells. So all of our photoreceptors are gonna be here on this top layer here. And the cones are gonna be a bit larger and interspace between the cone cells are gonna be rod cells. And all of the nuclei for the rod and the cone cells are gonna be located here in this layer of nuclei. The second cell type are gonna be our interneurons. And there are going to be three types of interneurons that are going to be present in the retina. And so the first type are horizontal cells. So horizontal cells are going to be located here and they're going to communicate um, specifically with rod and cone cells. The second type are, are bipolar cells. So the bipolar cells are going to communicate with rod and cone cells as well as this lower level of uh, retinal ganglion cells. Uh, the third cell type are going to be the amacrine cells, and so that's the third cell type here, and those cell types are going to be communicating um, specifically with the retinal ganglion cells down here. And then the last group or cell type uh, is going, are going to be our ganglion cells, and they're going to be at the lower level down here. So if we look at different uh, expression of C-alpha versus C-beta expression, we can see that C alpha um, expression is going to, C alpha is going to be localized in all of the different cell layers of the retina. So we have it in the photoreceptor cells, the interneuron cells, as well as the retinal ganglion cells. And if we contrast that to what we see for uh, C beta, we can see that there are marked differences in localization for C beta. So we still see um, C beta in the uh, photoreceptors and the interneurons, as well as the retinal ganglion cells. But if we specifically look at the different localization patterns, we see that C alpha is going to be localized at the tip um, of our in, in the photoreceptor cells. So this is the, the location where the photoreceptor, this is the inner segment, connects with the outer segment of the photoreceptor cells. And we term this the cilia transition zone, as well as C alpha is highly expressed in the cell body of the photoreceptor cells, both rods and cones. If we look at uh, expression or localization of C beta, we can see C beta um, is mostly localized in the ellipsoid of the inner segment of the photoreceptor cells. And then we also see um, high localization of C beta in the retinal ganglion cells. So you can see that um, both C alpha and C beta are highly uh, localized or highly expressed in throughout the, all the layers of the, the retina. However, you can see that there are distinct differences in the pattern of localization. And if we were to focus a little bit more um, of our uh, examination into the photoreceptors, we can see uh, even stronger difference um, come between the different uh, C-alpha and C-beta localization. So for C-alpha, again, we see it um, throughout the cell body 
of the rods and the cone cells. But we can see increased or enriched expression of the C alpha protein um, here at the tips of the, the photoreceptor inner segment. So this is going to be where the photoreceptor inner segment uh, combines with the outer segment. And so we see a strong uh, localization of C alpha here at this transition zone between the inner segment and the outer segment. And we also see uh, increased in expression of C alpha along the membrane of this outer segment. So here we can see um, C alpha all along this membrane here. If you refer to the cartoon, it's going to be um, this membrane here. So this here is the outer segment of the photoreceptor and then high expression here in the transition zone between the inner segment and the outer segment, and then uh, in expression throughout the, the cell body. Whereas for C beta, we see high expression in this um, pocket or ellipsoid for the inner segment. So this is going to be the inner segment, um, inner uh, photoreceptor inner, seg inner segment. And so that's going to be high expression here. And if we look at if there are co-expressions between rods and cone cells, um, we have we stain for um, a rod marker for so this is a mark rho is a marker for rod cells and PNA is a marker for cone cells. And we can see again that C alpha is expressed throughout the cell body of the rods and cone cells, as well as in this transition zone between the inner and outer segment and in the outer segment membrane. But we don't see co-localization of uh, C alpha in the inner inner membrane space where the photoreactive pigments for rod cells are included, nor in the um, where the the cone cell uh, photoreactive pigments are expressed. Similarly, we see the same to be true for C beta. Again, C beta is highly localized to this inner segment uh, ellipsoid but it's not included in the outer segment where we see the photoreactive pigments for rod cells, nor the photoreactive pigments for um, the cone cells either. And one, so we decided to also look into two of the regulatory subunits. So we looked into R2 alpha and R2 beta um, to see if we could determine the localization um, throughout the cell, um, cells of the retina. And what we found is for um, two, uh, R2 alpha, we found that it was highly expressed in the uh, rods and cone cells, so the cell body, as well as in the axons, as well, and in the synapses of the interneurons. However, it was absent from that um, inner segment um, ellipsoid, as well as absent from the outer segment. We saw a similar expression for R2 beta, um, meaning we saw localization in the, the cell body of the rods and the cone cells. However, we did see significant differences between R2 alpha and R2 beta localization, where R2 beta was mainly um, expressed in the, the cell body of the cone cells in the, and in the axons of the cone cells, whereas R2 alpha was found in both rods and cone cells. And just to delve a little bit deeper into co-localization or co-expression, of the different PKA subunits, we looked at um, expression of two different two two different uh, subunits in the same sections. So in this here, we can see that localization of C alpha and R two alpha are the most similar of the subunits. So we see good co localization for C alpha and R two alpha in the cell body of the rods and the cone cells. However. Uh, C alpha is going to be the only subunit that we see in this transition zone between the inner and outer segment, as well as the only subunit that we see in the membrane of the outer segment. When we look at uh, co-localization R2 alpha and C beta, we can see that these two subunits are not co-localizing in the photoreceptors. Uh, so we see, again, C beta is mainly uh, contained within this ellipsoid, of the photoreceptors, whereas R2 alpha is in the cell body. When we look at co-localization co of R2 beta and R2 alpha, again, they're both expressed in the photoreceptor cell body, so both rods and cones, but we see an enrichment of R2 beta in these cone cells. So these are the larger cells with the 
the larger ellipsoids that are present here, and we see high localization expression of this R2 beta protein. When we compare that to the R2 alpha localization, we can see that R2 alpha is present in these cells, but it's also present in the surrounding cells, which are going to be our rod cells. So just to give a general uh, outline of the localization patterns that we found for C alpha, C beta, and R2 alpha, and R2 beta. So for C alpha, um, we looked at uh, for the cones and the rods, we see it in the outer segment membrane. So of both cones and rods, as well as in this uh, transition zone between the outer segment and the inner segment. And then we see localization also throughout the cell body of the rods and the cone cells. When we look at C beta localization, we see C beta localization um, mostly in the ellipsoid so of the inner segment for both rods and cones. For R2 alpha, we see expression throughout the cell body of rods and cones. And similar for R2 beta, we see expression throughout the cell body, mostly in the, in the, in the cone cells. So one of the things that we noticed when we were started our um, investigation of the different subunits was that this, this high expression or localization of C beta in this ellipsoid of the cone and the rod cells. And that ellipsoid is known to house a lot of the mitochondria for the photoreceptors. We wanted to look at whether or not C beta was possibly co-localized with mitochondria in these cell types. We looked at um, staining of C beta along with a marker for mitochondria, so a marker for oxfos. And um, during our uh, experimentation, we found that yes, that C beta again in this ellipsoid of uh, the photoreceptor cells does localize, co-localize with mitochondria in these cell types. So you can see really great co-localization that we see in yellow here um, throughout these photoreceptor um, inner segment ellipsoids. But it, it's not only contained to these cell types here in the photoreceptors, we also see good co-localization with mitochondria and um, throughout the different cell types of the retina. So we see co-localization um, of mitochondria and C-beta in the interneurons as well as in the retinal ganglion cells. If we were to take a closer look at um, this, just the photoreceptor cells, we see that, again, uh, mitochondria and C-beta are highly co-localized in the photoreceptor cells. And if we look at a, um, a Z-stack or um, looking at throughout the, the depth of the entire cell, we can see that this ellipsoid bag um, in the photoreceptor cells is full of mitochondria as well as full of C-beta, uh, and they are both co-localized throughout this, this area. We this look a little bit in more, we can see high expression of C-beta and mitochondria in the retinal ganglion cells here. And so here we did a, um, a deeper investigation of the retinal ganglion cells. We found, again, really good co-localization of C-beta with mitochondria throughout the depth of the cell. If we were to contrast that to C-alpha, we see that C-alpha is not localized with mitochondria. So again, we have a, our marker for mitochondria and it um, shows that there's high expression in the inner segment ellipsoid, but we don't see co-localization of the C-alpha with mitochondria. We will take a closer look um, again, we see mitochondria and then we see C-alpha present throughout the cell body and in this transition zone and in the outer segment membrane, but we don't see uh, co-localization with mitochondria. So here we have the mitochondria here, uh, the transition zone um, here in green, and if you can see um, through a lateral section of the cell that you don't have co-localization of C-alpha with uh, mitochondria in this context. However, when we were looking at the differences between C-alpha and C-beta in the photoreceptor cells, um, as I mentioned earlier, we did see um, high enrichment of C-alpha in this transition zone between the inner segment of the photoreceptor cells and the outer segment. Um, and this is referred to as the transition zone. So we um, feel noted that this was highly, C-alpha was highly expressed in this transition zone 
uh, the cilia transition zone. And we wanted to investigate that a bit further. And to do that, we used AHI-1, which is a known marker for the transition zone, cilia transition zone. And, and you can see similar to AHI-1, where we have strong localization of AHI-1 in this, um, this bridge between the inner and outer segment, you can see that there is striking a resemblance of C-alpha localization uh, and AHI-1 localization, which confirms our, our belief that, that C-alpha is in this uh, cilia transition zone. We also looked at acetylated tubulin, which is a marker for cilia, and we found that um, C-alpha and acetylated tubulin did not co-localize. Instead, it showed a, a stacked localization. So C-alpha was in this transition zone or at the base of the connecting cilia. Uh, and then layered on top of that, we saw expression of acetylated tubulin, which is known to be present in the axoneme of cilia. This is further confirmation that C-alpha is present in this transition zone in the, between the inner and outer segment um, and could be a protein of interest um, to look in to, for the cilia transition zone. So further exploration um, we, we did for C alpha versus C beta expression. Uh, and as Susan mentioned earlier, so we have differences in the protein sequences. So we have our C alpha protein sequences but then C beta have, has different uh, isoforms for um, C beta. So we look specifically at C beta one, C beta three, C beta four, and C beta four AB. Uh, and if we look at the sequences for these different C beta proteins, we can see um, there are different promoter, uh, specific promoter regions for each of the proteins. So we have uh, C beta one, which is the longest version that we looked at for our study. And then we have three shorter, shorter versions. So C-beta-3, C-beta-4, C-beta-4-AB. So they each have their um, different promoter um, signals. And then AB, uh, C-beta-4-AB has additional exons we termed A and B. And what we did to investigate this is look um, is to use an emerging technology. So we use base scope duplex assay to detect C-alpha and C-beta subunit expression in human retina. Um, and what we found is that uh, C-alpha is, is, again, as we mentioned earlier, is expressed in all of the tissue layers, as well as C-beta-4. So C-alpha and C-beta-4 are in, is in the outer nuclear layer. So this is going to be where our uh, photoreceptor nuclei are present. It's present in the inner nuclear layer, which is where our interneurons are contained, as well as in the retinal ganglion cell layer, or where the retinal ganglion cells are. So we contrast that to expression of C-beta-3. We can see that C-beta-3 is mostly in the photoreceptors and partially in the interneurons um, and not so much in the retinal ganglion cells. And if we look again at C-beta-1 versus C-beta-4-AB, we see C-beta-4-AB is highly expressed, um, are present in the uh, photoreceptor nuclei, their nuclei of interneurons as well as the nuclei of the retinal ganglion cells. So based on this analysis, we believe that C-beta-4 and C-beta-4-AB, because they are present in all layers, so the outer nuclear layer, the inner nuclear layer, and the retinal ganglion cell layer, we believe that this um, is potentially the uh, mitochondrial associated isoform um, for C-beta. So it's gonna be C-beta-4 and C-beta-4-AB. So with that in mind, we are hoping to look at um, PK and disease, and we're looking at potential human diseases that could be associated with PK C beta specifically expression. And the first um, disease that we're looking at is going to be primary open angle glaucoma. So uh, it is characterized by vision loss due to the formation of the optical disc. This can cause nerve damage, so this is due to a slow and progressive degeneration of retinal ganglion cells and axons due to an increase in intraocular pressure. Uh, and part of our team, Dorota, um, first established this in 2015 and looking at um, uh, retinal ganglion cell death after five days of increased um, intraocular pressure. And she found that this did lead to, in, to retinal ganglion cell death. 
And what is interesting for us at this point is that the, diff the PKI swarms that are going to be expressed most prevalently in the retinal ganglion cells is actually C beta and R1 beta. We're going to be looking into um, the relevance of C beta and R1 beta um, in this process. Secondly, we're looking at diabetes with another collaborator. So diabetic nephropathy is characterized by extracellular matrix buildup and fibrosis. And PKA signaling pathway, it modulates ECM metabolism via meprin cleavage of catalytic subunits. And one of our collaborators found that PKA does co-localize with meprin um, in di diabetic uh, mice kidneys. And they found that the meprins translocate to the cytosol and that PKA cytosolic expression uh, actually increases during this process. So some of the next steps that we're hoping to eventually uh, address are going to be how does intracellular PKA localization change in di diabetic kidneys? And is this tri translocation isoform specific? So is it C alpha, C beta? Uh, uh, and we're hoping to uh, address these, these questions with our collaborators. Uh, and lastly, we're looking at Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is uh, newly termed as type three diabetes because insulin deficiency and insulin resistance mediate Alzheimer's disease type neurodegeneration. So as you um, increase from BRAC zero to one, so this is low in incidence of Alzheimer's disease to more um, higher uh, progression of disease. So BRAC zero to one is the lowest um, level of Alzheimer's disease and increases to BRAC six. And as you move from BRAC0 to BRAC6, you see a decrease in the growth factors for insulin, um, as well as in the growth factor receptors. And there is evidence that leaks PKA signaling in the brain to learning development and other neurodegenerative diseases. And as Susan mentioned in the introduction, that over 50% of the PKA uh, C subunit in the brain is going to be um, C beta. So she mentioned that it's actually C beta 4, um, but uh, so that C beta 4 splice variant is expressed almost exclusively in the brain. So we want to look at C beta and to see if we can determine if it has any involvement in the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And this is this project has just recently started within the past um, few weeks. So we have some preliminary data looking at hope hopefully identifying some disease phenotypes that are related to C-beta expression. And so um, what I recently looked at was uh, C-beta expression um, in patients, uh, brains of patients from, that suffer from Alzheimer's disease. So this is a, the low, one of the lower levels, BRAC level two. So I stain for uh, C-beta as well as the mitochondrial marker that I mentioned in the retina. And you can see that, again, we see good uh, co-localization of C-beta with mitochondria, even in these, these brain samples. You can see in this section of the tissue, see good co-localization of C-beta with mitochondria. And if we were to con contrast that to a more progressed um, disease state, we have potentially identified a disease phenotype, which we are hoping to explore within the next um, few months. So here we have a patient who's at graph level six, so one of the, ho the highest level um, of Alzheimer's disease uh, and stained for, again, C-beta and mitochondria. So again, not only do C-beta and the mitochondrial marker um, co-localize, but we also see an increased incidence of my mitochondria throughout the, the tissue layer um, for these patients. So again, this is uh, real, brand new data that we're just beginning to analyze and to explore. Um, so we would, we're planning on pursuing this. So any input or any feedback on this would be most welcome. So just some conclusions and future directions to wrap up the, my part of the talk today. So in the human retina, we found that C alpha, R2 alpha and R2 beta are co-expressed in the same cell populations and that the C beta gene expression is cell type dependent. For um, glaucoma and ILP, we are hoping to investigate changes in PKA ice form expression um, in mouse retina. Uh, for diabetes, we are planning on, hope, we hope to investigate changes in PKA ice form localization. 
in diabetic mice kidney and following induced kidney trauma. And lastly, one of the new projects that we just started to work on is looking at Alzheimer's disease. So we're hoping to map PKI form expression in early, mid and late stage Alzheimer's disease brain. And one of the long-term goals for this project is to identify an early reporter or a biomarker for the different diabetic related cognitive decline. Um, so some possible targets that we've identified are gonna be macrophages as well as exosomes. So with that, I want to thank everyone that's been involved in the project. So Susan has been a great mentor um, and I've worked closely with her as well as with Frank, um, Frank Ma, who is in the lab and is, uh, who has been very instrumental in the project as well as Dr. Um, Roni Ilu, uh, who uh, began the project a few years ago as well as our collaborators with the Rota, UCI, and various collaborators throughout um, the US and Germany. And with that, I will thank my funding sources. The IRACTA um, Fellowship provides a lot of support for uh, minority and underrepresented groups. So I want to thank them uh, as well as the NIH. And with that, Susan and I will take any questions that you guys have. Great, wonderful. Thank you both for wonderful talks. Um, there is a question already posted, and uh, it comes from Kanan. So how does the C-beta localization change if you truncate the N-terminus similar to the C-alpha? If you have any thoughts or predictions on the C-beta sub substrates in the brain? Oh. Let me unmute you, Susan. So I think, Susan, I think you're muted. So I think, so I've done mostly localization yeah. of the proteins in, uh, in tissue, so in the retina as well as in the brain. Uh, so I, I'm not as familiar with truncating proteins, but maybe Susan might have some insight in the question, on the question. So a, a parallel focus in the lab is actually to express these proteins and see how differently they behave. I mean, for uh, C-beta-4 has only one residue really left of the 14, so it's, it's truncated. Um, we haven't explored um, actually truncating C beta one and see how different that makes its function. We did we did do that with C alpha one, and it's very unstable in C alpha one. Um, and if you do the entire N terminus, um, you can see that the regulation is is very different. So we we anticipate this will be important for targeting this this these fourteen residues. Um, we haven't explored that. And another way, and perhaps a more fruitful way to explore that is just to express the N terminus, um, like the N terminus of C beta 2 and C beta 4 AB, to see can you get specific targeting of that? And does that interfere selectively with function? So it's a big, it's an important question, but I can't tell you that yet. Great. Um, I encourage other people to, to post uh, additional questions in the chat or in the Q&A. If you prefer to uh, make a uh, oral question to speak up, you can do the raise a hand business and I can uh, let you speak. Um, I, you, you spoke about the uh, mitochondrial expression, the co-expression of the C-beta-4. Uh, with, with that, uh, is there some kind of... Uh, additional interaction regarding the functionality of the C-beta-4 within the mitochondria that you think is, is uh, affecting it being expressed more so uh, co-expressing than say the alpha? We don't really, I mean, a major question now is of course, where is it in the mitochondria, is it in the matrix? in the inner membrane space. So that's a major question. Um, it's uh, obviously doing something different, but we don't, we don't really know what that is. And, and one, one really interesting thing of the retina is that the mitochondria in these highly differentiated neurons, uh, it's behaving differently in each of them. And in these outer, uh, in, the, in the rod and cone cells, these are replacing um, the outer segment lipids and proteins, 10% every day. So they're really using a lot of mitochondria energy to rebuild proteins, to rebuild lipids. And so this is a big, 
um, a big question with regard to metabolism. What is the metabolism of the mitochondria in the rod and cone cells? It's very, very highly specialized. The only time you see this kind of big clustering of mitochondria like that is in the sperm, where you again have its regulating motor function. But um, uh, clearly there are specific functions and what it's doing, usually the rod and cone cells are glycolytic cells. They use glucose and then they give off lactic acid. And so um, they're using the mitochondria in different ways. And one person we've talked with um, is uh, Jared Rudder at um, University of Utah, who really looks at the mitochondrial function of different cells. And this is, again, the retina is a good model system because you have a set of seven, eight different kinds of neurons where the mitochondria are doing different things. So it's a major, major question, but Thank you. Um, so uh, you have a comment, Janae, from Joel Brenson saying, Room Raider gives you 10 out of 10. I have no idea. <laughs> I guess the answer you're using. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I also have a question from, this is Mark Haynes at UNM. Um, could either of you speak of, uh, or make comments on the, the potential known substrate of PKA? And also if the mitochondria somehow control the PKA expression, I guess, again, it goes with what you were just saying, that, that it's a, a very uh, a specific cell where the, um, uh, uh, where the energy usage is very unique for um, those. But it is substrates, anyone for PKA? Janae, do you want to comment or? Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't think I completely understand the so the substrate specific to the cones in the rod cell or in general, I think at least for the mitochondria, I don't think that mitochondria are necessarily um, controlling the expression of PKA. I think the activity of the mitochondria, so producing um, uh, substrates are molecules like CO2 that could then uh, go on to activate things like the soluble cyclase to produce the um, play into the regulation of PKA in terms of activating or deactivating, and that can downstream lead to different effectors that will regulate, you know, the metabolism of the cell. As Susan was just saying, in these, uh, the cone cells specifically, that you have high turnover rate and different forms of metabolism that are doing, it's going to be present. I don't think it's necessarily um, controlling the expression, so expression of the different subunits, but I think it's going to be play more into the role of activation of PK and then activation of other downstream effectors that could lead to differences in the, the, the metabolic rate and the uses of lipids throughout the different cells, um, throughout the cell. So I could also add um, a really important question is substrates of C-alpha versus substrates of C-beta. And probably um, the Knepper lab at NIH, they look at um, kidney um, uh, tubules. And so they have knocked out C-beta. These are things that do really need to be done rigorously. Did CRISPR-Cas knock out of C-beta versus C-alpha? And then did uh, proteomics and, and phosphoproteomics. And we have begun to do this to do this, you really need mouse tissues. It's hard to get, I mean, you can't do this with the retina tissues. So the mouse models are not quite the same, but you can get the tissues there. And then you can do global proteomic changes, global phosphoproteomic changes. And we're beginning to do that and look at that as a function of um, glucose deprivation or serum deprivation is really important. But what Knepper found was, Indeed, if you did that, you found it seemed to suggest that protein expression levels uh, changed differently if you knocked out C-alpha versus C-beta. And also the protein uh, substrate levels, the fossil proteome changed. And, um, and so, you know, we know from um, knockout of, of C-beta alone is not sufficient to give an embryonic lethality, but C-alpha and C-beta together are. Um, and so what is, what is C-beta doing specifically and what are its substrates? It's a really, really important question, not only in the mature retina like we have here, but also in development. C-beta is going to play a major role in development. And so um, that's, that's a really important question. I think the fossil proteomics, uh, proteomics, that's why teams like this, this is a really, really important next step to do. Great. Um, I will uh, open up, see if there's any more questions that people post have here for our speakers today. Um, 
If not, then I take this opportunity to thank you both. Uh, it was enlightening, interesting, and uh, beautiful uh, pictures. Very, very lovely. I appreciate those. Um, and uh, I hope that people find uh, these sessions to be fruitful and informative. And I look forward to having you all join in our next session. Um, that will be happening in on uh, October, I believe, 7th. And we will be uh, talking about GPCRs at that point. Um, and once again, uh, thank you all for coming. And thank you again to the speakers for their lovely talks and presentations. And um, here comes another one. Thank you, everyone, for wonderful presentations. So thank, thank you. you all. Thank you, Anna, bye -bye. for coordinating everything. Yes. Bye-bye. <laughs>